uh, points that's come up, and we're going to have them come up <coughs> excuse me, to the front here uh, to talk a little bit of, uh, about uh, their experiences. And uh, as a panel, I think we'll get uh, some interesting uh, dialogue going. <coughs> So, introducing uh, uh, Mike Gray. So, he has uh, worked for the uh, UK's Health and Safety Executive for more than 30 years. And he's been active in both ergonomics, human factors, which uh, we'll assume <coughs> right now are the same thing, in a wide range of industries. He currently provides the professional lead <coughs> to a national team of specialists, the health and safety inspectors. He's written uh, technical guidance on musculoskeletal disorders and manual materials handling and supported enforcement uh, regulations in this area. And he's currently the UK's expert on a working group which is advising the European Commission on drafting of a new directive on uh, musculoskeletal disorders. So again, uh, Mike comes to us uh, very well recommended to tell us about what's going on here. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here, and it's great to be here. I've just had to sort of shoehorn in this particular seminar between doing lots of work back in England and going on vacation. But hopefully everything's going to work out okay, and I'll be able to do that. Um, yes, I've part of a, a national team within the UK looking at ergonomics type issues and we have people scattered across the country trying to provide support to our frontline regulatory inspectors on matters ergonomics and this is something which has built up over what just the last decade I suppose in many ways previous to my current role I was very much more on the research side of things but in 2005, I went to set up a team of specialist inspectors to try and actually provide more of the frontline specialist support which might be needed across many of the industries. Um, our in specialist inspectors tend to be trained to master's levels in ergonomics, and we've got a team of, I think, 16 people around the country at the moment. Now it's good to talk about manual handling because it is such a, a big issue. Many of the things that the other speakers have said chime very much with the sort of things which go on in the UK. And I want to try and sort of unpick it a little bit for you and try and to say how we are actually trying to tackle the various bits which come our way. And this comes from the unions, comes from the employers, comes from the, the legal teams, the policy makers. Our role within Europe sort of and allows us to do certain things and not other things. All these things are quite important. But I should also say we are in the front line as well, and manual materials handling sometimes does result in fatal accidents. Last year, one happened only a few hundred yards from my office, in fact, where somebody was unloading some steel girders from the back of a flatbed lorry, and these things weighed about 500 kilograms. And he was trying to unload these by hand. And the thing slipped, fell on him, and crushed him to death. Now, had he actually done his risk assessments beforehand, actually worked out a safe way of working, and all these things which our manual materials handling regulations would say you should do, then perhaps that sort of thing can be prevented. So sometimes it can be very serious. Unfortunately, not always. I've put up some of our statistics, and they're not so different to other people's statistics, I guess. Um, but one of the things I perhaps would caution you on is thinking of ahead of time about what sort of information can you collect, and then how can you actually track that as things goes along. Because it is very tricky to do. And if government tells you to collect numbers in a different way, then it's a challenge to actually show trends or which are going down or up. And the things which you can measure are quite tricky as well. So we have something called the Labour Force Survey, which allows us to look at self-reported injuries and we try to do some calculations based on that. But that has all sorts of caveats in terms of the quality of that data, in terms of 
actual numbers. So we can put some confidence limits on it, and there you have some of the things. But obviously, it's a big problem. We're talking about over 9 million working days lost. We're talking about costs to the UK economy of £7 billion. Pounds. Now, OK, you can calculate that in all sorts of different ways, and our economists will do it one way. Someone else's economists may do it and a different way, but there's no getting away from the fact that we're talking about an important problem. And the other side of things is getting people back to work after an MSD, and how does that relate? So it's the times off work and what can be done to make sure people transfer back into the working population. So I was asked to talk a bit about the UK approach to manual materials handling. But actually, as I put up there, it's very much a European approach. And on Wednesday this week, I should have been going to a meeting in Luxembourg to talk about the European approaches. And it's a very different organization to what we have in front of us here. We have people from 25 member states. We have simultaneous translation between Hungarian and Swedish, or Greek and Latvian. You can see it's quite tricky making progress in that sort of arrangement. But we do have common regulation at the moment, and we're trying to update that. But just imagine trying to get consensus, or even a common understanding of what's going on. I often find it strange that everybody has agreed that the English text is what they like, and to me, it makes no sense at all. <laughs> but So the European approach, which is regulation, we have a U European directive, it is called, and each of the countries within Europe puts their own laws in place to implement that directive. So that's the way that works. And I guess in some ways it's a bit like Australia. They have a, something across the board, but each of the different parts does their own thing. And sometimes the results are slightly different, shall we say. So what happens in Italy may not be quite the same as what happens in the UK. And we argue about that a little bit too. But the important thing is that we try to avoid hazardous operations, hazardous manual handling operations, as far as is reasonably practicable. And reasonably practicable is something which is subject to legal test in many ways. It's talking about it not being a disproportionate cost that you should have to make to avoid that uh, hazard eventuating. And if you can't do that, then you have to make a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. And that's often where our inspectors start to argue with employers, perhaps, about whether any risk assessment, if it exists, is suitable, is it sufficient. And that's where they may need some expert assistance with. And then not only do they have to assess that risk, but they do actually have to reduce the risk of injury so far as is reasonably practicable. So control measures of various types which they may have to adopt. And this is the sort of booklet we put out in the UK about how to uh, comply with the UK laws which implement the European directive. And the actual directive itself isn't particularly long, but you can see there's quite a few pages here which try to explain what it is that it, we're trying to get at. You can see up there it tells you about what is manual handling in the, the European context, and it's transporting of things and it talks about lifting, putting down, pushing and pulling, and so on. It will include moving people. It does include moving animals. And various times, these things come across my desk as being issues which need to be looked at. We've got a, a project at the moment looking at safe handling of cattle. And they can be fairly temperamental things to actually get involved in handling. You don't want to lift one, that's for sure. So in terms of where we have got to, we say, we say up there, if you can't avoid risk assess, but we don't have specific weight limits. And when all this regulation was being discussed, I suppose in the 80s was when a lot of that discussion occurred, it was decided that actual weight limits were not particularly helpful. There had been some discussion earlier to that that people shouldn't lift more than 50 kilograms or 35 kilograms and 
all this sort of things in a very prescriptive sort of way. And we got away from that. Interesting, if you go to Poland, they still have a lot of particular limits for sorts of limits, so, sorts of lifting. So they have something which 15-year-olds uh, are allowed to lift and not more than. They have something for older people as well or for different industries. We got away from that. But in many ways, different countries can interpret the general duties of the directive in things which suit their particular culture and history. So the directive and our regulations tell people they have to take account of these particular things in their risk assessment. So this is a must. They have to look at things in the task, things affect the, the individual involved, the load and the environment, much like some of the things that Jean was talking about in their particular regulation. And I said we didn't put in weight limits. But when we put our guidance together, we actually put some numbers in there. And we often have discussion about whether that was advisable or not. Because this is what we've got in terms of a risk filter. Now the idea is to try and say when is it that people need to take account of this regulation and when is it actually something they could avoid. It, it's, it's not sufficiently serious hazardous in their place that they need to do anything. And we're using this risk filter to try and say okay below this you don't need to get too concerned. So if you're lifting 25 kilos at about the waist level perhaps you don't need to get too concerned, but then there's a whole lot of caveats about, well, you must be lifting in a particular way, you must have good grips, and it must be um, in a symmetric position and so on. The problem is, because we put that in, everyone says, oh, 25 kilos, that's the limit, and they don't look any further. And that's our challenge, in a way, is try and get people's brains engaged, that this is a starting point, it's not actually where you stop thinking. So the risk filter is meant to ensure that about 95% of working people would be protected. So in that case, you don't need to do a detailed risk assessment. And it should help people identify those things which need to be prioritized. And we give similar things for carrying short distances, pushing and pulling, and handling while seated. We also then give them some sheets to, to sort of fill in in terms of the, their assessment checklist. It's a suggested way of doing it. They don't have to do it that way. But by law, they have to consider all these things. So the task, the individual, the load, and the environment. So this preliminary bit says, OK, is an assessment needed? And you look at your filter. You look at the other discounting factors, like have you got twisting? Can you grip it? Where Badly, is it sort of uh, uneven? And if you're within those sort of constraints, you can say, no, I don't need a detailed assessment. That's it done. However, if you do need to do a detailed assessment, it gets a little bit more involved. And we have some pages of risk assessment which people have to take account of. And this is where it's got quite difficult for many employers in trying to comply with the law. But I should say also it got quite difficult for our inspectors in knowing whether people had complied with the law. And this was the challenge that we had, I suppose, in about 2000. How do we actually make things a little bit more straightforward for people? How do we actually try to take people with us rather than say, well, this is what the law says. You must take account of all these different factors. And this is where we developed our manual handling assessment charts, or MAC charts, which have been around now since about 2003. And these were first produced as training material for our inspectors, something that they would be able to take in to the workplace with them and do a quick assessment. And they were produced in that form because it's the same size as the inspector's notebooks. So they could take it with them, and they wouldn't have to worry about having too many other bits of paper and so on. It could just clip in the back, and they can do a quick assessment. 
Now, they were put to quite a lot of um, testing and those sort of things. And as part of that, duty holders, employers, unions as well, got quite interested in this approach. And it's been quite successful in the UK of tra training people as to what are the things they ought to be looking for. And I'll just talk you through quickly some of those things. So MAC is an initial screening tool to help identify those things which are high risk. It's got a, a scoring system to help it prioritize, but generally it tells you if you're in the red area, the amber area, or the green area. And our inspectors can just about cope with that. Yeah, they can. <laughs> Actually, we made it a little bit more complicated. We put a purple area in there as well. But, uh, and the purple areas, those areas which we think actually some needs some immediate type of action. So that's where we're trying to get to, and we have to, a process whereby we're trying to lead them through it. So one of the things we look at then is, okay, how much are you lifting and how frequently are you lifting? And we get people to put that on that graph so we have the weight of the load off the left-hand side. We have the frequency along the bottom. And we have the boundaries based on mainly psychophysical information. So about half the women will be able to easily cope with that sort of, that'll be acceptable to their lifting situations. Half the men at the amber to red boundary. 10% from the red to purple. So it's trying to provide a rationale for the way that this is provided. We've also got the 50 kilogram limit of any type of handling, because even though it may be done infrequently, if something goes wrong, if you're lifting something of that sort, then you could well be in trouble. We're also getting people to categorize some of the posture type information. And it's fairly rough and ready. Say we wanted inspectors to be able to do it. We also find that duty holders can do it too. So that's good. So looking at how near or far things are from the body with some pictures to help understand that, up and down, and so on. And we have a flow chart of the things that you go around. And once you're skilled, actually, you can go straight to the flow chart and just click the things that you need to do on it rather than have to go through the more uh, instructional bits of the Mac. So we have three of these. One is for lifting and lowering. One is for um, carrying. And the other is for team lifting. What we haven't got so far is something which looks at uh, pushing and pulling. We have a score sheet which you can fill in, and there's on our website the interactive PDF, which will help you to do that. So it is a way of trying to guide people to do the risk assessment. It covers the main things that you need to do as part of the regulation. The things that it doesn't do are it doesn't allow you to look at the individual so much. So some, that's something you have to consider separately. And it also alerts you to some of the psychosocial issues that you may need to consider, but which aren't part of the risk assessment as written there. So that's all very well, but I say it was written for inspectors, and the expectation is that they will want to use that in enforcement action. So we need to actually link that to what action are they going to take? When do they actually need to lay down the law? When do they need to give gentle advice? And say we have policy things on enforcement. It says there it must be consistent. So if I give that advice, it should be the same as someone giving advice up in Scotland or down in the southwest of England. It should be proportionate in that it should be related to the sort of offence that it is. And it should be transparent. You should be able to understand where it's come from. And the Mac's quite good at trying to help people deal with that side of things. It's quite clear.
clear how thing you get to the result. It gives you advice on, some, on the consistency. What we're trying to do look at is the proportionality and making that a little bit more clear. So we had to put guidance on applying our general enforcement model to using the MAC. So we need to consider, is someone likely to get injured doing this? What's the consequences? If you're lifting um, up, up on a steelwork, then the consequences of things going wrong may be greater than if you're <coughs> lifting down on the ground. So using these sort of approach, we come up with our initial enforcement expectation. That's what the action we would expect an inspector to give first. Similarly to <coughs> me, Australia, we've got these sort of outcomes that we can give, so verbal advice. A letter is a little bit stronger than verbal, but it's not been too bad about it. And then improvements, prohibition, immediate prohibition, and prosecution. I've put up some of our enforcement data. I don't know if you can make out those tiny letters, but the third from the right is things which have been to do with manual handling. And that's a, a similar letter, it's a similar level to our general workplace. It's a little bit more than our display screen equipment enforcement and about similar to our provision and use of work equipment regs. But in many cases, the sort of enforcement um, things which are given are re related to the general duties of the Health and Safety at Work Act or the management of health and safety at work. So sometimes it's one of those regulations which will get cited as part of um, trying to deal with the situation. But basically we've got something like 26 um, improvement notices there and one of those is a prohibition notice. But so, sort of situation, this is one that we looked at uh, earlier this year. It's a company that um, distributes lead sheet. So that's a bit of lead that they've got there. And they're moving it from the racking behind them onto pallets to go out. So we say, okay, where are we with that sort of task? Should we be taking strong action, giving advice, or whatever? Now some of those rolls weigh 170 kilos, so actually they're fairly substantial. <laughs> so we're working on that case at the moment. However, this is quite an easy workplace in many ways. Delivering it on a construction site and getting it up onto the roof is an even more difficult ball game. This shows someone uh, at a coffee making place, and that's a, a sack of coffee he's got there. That weighs about 70 kilos, and he has to lift it and put it into that hopper there without falling in himself. And you can see that that flags up, that is in the purple area. This is one of the, the prohibition type situations that we got to. So Mac immediately sh shows you the things you should concentrate on, but also relates to the actions. So the consequences could be serious, significant, or minor. But we also need to think about, is there any special things about that individual? It could be a, a pregnant workers or a particular sort of workforce. And we sometimes get into the conversation about, well, we have very strong people at our workplace. They're specially selected and so on. So yeah, we have to see how they actually <laughs> think they control the risks that way. But our benchmark is that there should be nil risk of serious injury. But that's really quite difficult in a manual handling type regime. So what we tend to be looking for, can there actually be some reasonably practicable controls to achieve this sort of thing, typically avoiding the action. But the importance of industry specific guidance is showing a demonstration of the state of the art, what is possible in that industry, is really quite useful to us. And that's one of the things we try to work with, 
to try and establish that's what is the state of the art. I'll put up just that's the guidance we give to our inspectors on the in initial enforcement expectation. If you have a purple, then it's an IN or consider a prosecution. If you're two reds, and then we're talking about an, an IN or a letter and so on. This is another situation where we got involved. It's the delivery of white goods and the company involved decided that you only really needed one person to drive that lorry, so you certainly didn't need anyone with him to help deliver this to people's homes. Weighs 80 kilos, and their ability to do a risk assessment is somewhat restricted ahead of time if they're going to take it to your home. And so we get into the realms of how do you actually try to control those risks in a reasonable way to stop people getting into situations where they're having to handle things which are rather too much for them. And we've worked with the company, in fact, in that case, to say, yes, we're not going to have one person activities. We're going to have these sort of devices available to help them, and so on. So we have some guidance there. And some, that's some of the links to our regulations, which are on our website. One of the things I should say about MAC is that within Europe, it was translated into 20-odd languages, and that's available on the European Union's um, website. It's, well, it's called handingloads.eu, and it's got information in different languages and various other campaign material and other sorts of things that they use within Europe in different countries. So something called the key uh, indicator model, which is used in Germany, for example, KIM. Also show, show on the bottom there that's our inspection pack. And what this is, is it's a compendium of information for inspectors on the different industries, the different solutions which are apl ap applicable to those industries, and the way that people might be able to use that in an inspection regime. Now, this is available on our website as well. It's un under the freedom of information part of it. So it's internal guidance, but because of the way we are regulated, we have to make it available to everybody. But you see there, that's the link to get to that. So that's a reasonably sort of uh, comprehensive list of things which we expect and information we have about these. The MAC charts, there's training material on our website and some other sort of resources shown. And that's a bit on the inspection pack. So examples of recent practicable controls, guidance, um, which may be industry guidance or it may be specific. Now, so approaches to actually making a difference, one of them, this shows people moving cartons of milk in the dairy. So I'm wor working with the dairy industry on things they can do to get it right. Um, so there they're moving two um, little trolleys of milk, which is fine if it's level, but guess what? It isn't always. Or working with the waste industry. That's one of the, uh, the council estates near London, and they didn't really put much provision in for collecting of waste when the things were built. And there's challenges now to dealing with that. So they have slopes, they pull things or steps and so on because they can't get the vehicles very close. And it seems that the waste industry are keep coming up with new challenges all the time on things. As the recycling bit increases, people come up with new ideas for how people can put things at the curbside which have to be handled. And we've seen people t putting trays in the top of wheelie bins which are full of glass and then people have to lift these out and transfer them to things and they have drawers they put in bins which you can put other things of cycling in and again people have to come at finding good ways of assessing that and it seems that every different um, municipality comes up with its own solution and some of them are good and some of them are really very poor so trying to keep a Ahead of that is quite tricky. The other side is the actual recycling bits themselves, where they take the things to, and we have people handling 
lots of sorting things on large conveyor belts. They have to be very wide to put all the stuff that goes through. People can't reach, and there's some quite large loads on that. So again, you'll find some information on our website on some of those emerging risks and things we think you can do to try and minimize it. So this is some of the strategies we're adopting. Raising awareness is one we've done quite a lot of with, with campaigns, media campaigns. Um, that's one of them, the, the Bax campaign, which ran for three times. That was a combined campaign of trying to train our own inspectors in MAC at that time, train unions members in MAC as well. It was an inspection campaign supported by our specialists. So we agreed that our specialist inspectors would do joint visiting with our regulatory inspectors on specific areas for a particular part of time. So we did a, a blitz for several, about a month on three successful, su successive um, occasions. We also had um, some of our media people involved and they came up with uh, this particular campaign. So it's meant to be a, a rock group called Back Pain and they were used to publicize things. Publicizing what? And I think that's been one of our challenges. What are you actually trying to tell people? Because telling them to risk assess doesn't actually communicate very well. The message that we tried to get across was that actually if you had back pain, you could still work. And that was perhaps the one which was more successful in terms of getting a message to the general population, the working population, that the advice on um, not being active if you had some pain was the one. So, should we, yeah? <laughs> I'm getting signals there. So getting involved with uh, stakeholders about campaigns, getting involved with the unions, doing their own thing alongside us, getting along with employers, telling, supporting us. So working all together and saying these were sort of the top tips that we gave people involving workers, training workers, checking solutions for new risks is always an important one because just because it looks good, maybe you've introduced something you hadn't thought about and tackle the high risks first. We have done some evaluation and you see there that musculoskeletal order disorders has not really ch changed a huge amount over the, that decade. It has gone down slightly if you look at the number of working days lost per employee over the, the decade, it's dropped from 0.5 to 0.4, which is a significant difference. We've also done particular evaluation of the regulations. We found about 30% of organizations had done nothing, but 77% had done some risk assessment. 71% had carried out training. And I think training is something you have to be wary about as well, because you have regulation it seemed that all that employers did straight away is to do some, get someone in to do it in training. So there's lots of companies trying to sell training to employers as a way of co them complying with regulation. And that actually, we have to pull back a little bit and say, you know, that doesn't actually deal with the risks. Um, and there's some more things there that people have done. Larger companies were much more likely to have done something and 48% thought the benefits outweighed the costs, compared to 11% who thought the reverse. So a net benefit there. And the costs of about £30 per employee. So that's the report on that, a second evaluation of the manual handling operations regs. Just mentioned design. Similarly to Australia, we have a design requirement it's actually related to people selling machinery. And health and safety is not allowed to be used as a barrier to trade, which means that every European country is meant to have the same minimum health and safety standards for their equipment. And there are a lot of standards which help to support that. There's particular ones on manual handling of machinery parts. So if you're a designer of a machine which has bits which need to be handled, then you have to, to do some sort of assessment make sure that you're not requiring too much of the people working with it or installing it or dismantling it and that sort of thing. 
future directions, there is a directive being worked on at the moment. It's ambitious title is to uh, link both manual handling, display screen equipment, and upper limb things into one directive. We're looking at doing other things with Mac to allow us, us to look at order picking, looking at, looking at pushing and pulling, and we have something which is pro being trialed at the moment. We've just put out new guidance on patient handling, and we're also trying to get industry to author guidance supported by us, so we may badge it with them, but give, taking, letting them take the lead. So I've just tried to trot through perhaps some of the things that we have done. Um, be happy to take any questions. So you're talking about the upward pressure of standards within Europe as compared to the downward pressure. Yeah, I'm not sure I quite get your point, actually. Um, I mean, there was... I mean, I think it's actually quite a, a real issue, this, this, the standard which ergonomics is being dealt with in Europe, maybe as against North America, but within the economy generally, within Europe, there are many downward pressures to deregulate, minimize, to simplify, and those sort of things. And those are sort of the challenges that we're having brought to us from our political masters in terms of c considering what are the simplest messages we can give, what are the most important things that we must tackle. And we are being made to look particularly strongly at some of the manufacturing issues and the high hazard areas and to give the low risk type, office type environment uh, simple tools so they can meet their legal requirements while not being very burdensome for them. So trying to get that balance, perhaps, of the burden and the simpl simplicity as against where the actual risks and hazards are. 